Good evening, Madam President. So the bill before us really uh, has two distinct parts, and I'm going to tackle the second part of the bill first, uh, simply uh, because I believe it's uh, easier and more quickly um, discussed, and that is the part that uh, essentially fine-tunes language that was added to our laws in recent years uh, requiring, uh, as uh, the chairman of the Labor Committee noted, uh, equal pay for equal work. Um, that phrase is worthy of, of a discussion. Uh, the language of the bill uh, does make some sort of sense, though, which is uh, it makes it quite clear that you cannot discriminate uh, against someone based on their gender, which I agree with the uh, gentle lady that that uh, is a good thing because discrimination based on gender is a bad thing. That was her quote, and I agree completely, although I would point out that this body has passed several bills in recent weeks that do precisely that. There's another bill that passed this chamber just last week that purposefully sets up a system by which we are going to uh, define every person as nothing more than their race and gender and say that we have to make our state boards and commissions uh, match the census figures. And in fact, that is absolutely nothing more than discriminating uh, based on uh, gender, which I agree is a bad thing. And we should never have passed that bill, Madam President. But this language that is being added in section, is it two? Section 2, subsection B, is a good thing. And that is that we are adding factors into what an employer may factor into determining whether or not they are paying one person more than another uh, so that it's clear that it is not based on sex, but rather the items that are here. Education, training, and experience are existing law, but the terms credentials, skills, and also geographic location are being added. I want to point out, Madam President, this is unbelievably ironic. Since just a few days ago, there was another bill before this chamber that said that we have to recall employees that are laid off in order of seniority. And when I offered an amendment saying that employers ought to be able to judge those people based on these exact things, credential, skill, and experience, that was voted down on a party line because those things apparently didn't matter and an employer could not take them into consideration for deciding who should be returned to work. But in this case, I'm very happy to see that we're using some common sense and realizing that employers do and have to factor in education, training, credential, skill, and experience when they make such decisions. So thank you very much for updating the bill to include those things. I would support Section two of this bill because of that, Madam President. But sadly, we are back on section one discussing a similar policy to others that have gone through this chamber recently that is in the nature of, again, managing businesses that do not belong to us. Telling employers how to run their businesses as if any of us have any idea how to run their businesses as if we have the experience or know-how to make these determinations. This bill, contrary to the way it was described, does not allow anything. The good chairman, who I honestly have great respect for, and I believe she is doing her best based on what she believes, said, quote unquote, this bill allows an employee to ask for a salary range when they are applying for a job. She then said it allows an employer to tell someone what the salary range is. And then finally, it allows a worker to ask, um, I forget what the last condition was, uh, when they were being hired, I, I presume. This bill doesn't allow anything. Make no mistake, Madam President, that is not how government works. The government doesn't allow things. The government only is a weapon of force. That is it. When we pass a law, we're telling people, essentially at the end of the barrel of a gun, what to do. Now, of course, I don't mean that literally on day one, that if you don't comply, someone's putting a gun to your head. But that's what happens with the law. 
If you fail to comply with a law, you end up in trouble. You get fined or you end up having to go to prison, and someone is holding a gun to your head to make sure that you follow through. If you don't pay your taxes, they arrest you and so on. The government only provides force. It does not allow. So I want to be clear about that. We do not say that the government allows this. The government is forcing a business owner to put this information in front of an employee. And if they fail to do so, there is a penalty. And that is on line 61 through 66. So I just want to make it clear. We're not going to use the word allows anymore when we're forcing someone to do something whether they want to or not. I get worked up on these bills, Madam President. You're absolutely right, because I came here as a representative of my constituents. People are so confused when we talk to them about what we do here. They don't understand the government necessarily sometimes, and I'm always happy to have the opportunity to explain to them the three branches of government. Well, when you're in the legislative branch of government, you are not the government, essentially. You are a representative of your constituents. You are working for them. You are there based on a promise to protect their rights. The government is something different entirely. That's the executive branch of government. They take the policy that we come up with and they enforce it. Well, my job is to make sure that the rights of my constituents and their concerns are looked after. And that means, Madam President, all of my constituents. Because my other pet peeve in this place is that every bill that comes before us is presented in the same way. It is for this group. I don't believe in groups. The entire country was founded on the concept of individual rights, not group rights. And in fact, groups don't have rights. Only individuals do. And when you start to say, this bill is for employees or workers, so we're going to put our weight on the scale against employers, that's not what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to make laws that apply to everyone equally, and we're supposed to be working together to ensure their freedom to enter into whatever agreements they choose in pursuit of their own happiness. That is the point of America. And in fact, Madam President, it is why it's the greatest country on earth. And every time we write another policy that impedes on that freedom, we are telling people that they cannot engage in their own pursuits. And when we do that, what we're doing is we're telling the economy to slow down. We're telling the economy, don't engage in that business opportunity. Do not do that. I don't mean to get so much off on a sidetrack, but I want to just point out one other thing about these policies and why they're misguided. Some people are under the assumption that there is only so much wealth in the world and that our job here is to write policy to move that wealth around using whatever political term is um, popular on that day, whether it's equity or whatever. Well, first off, that's not even true. The thing about America is that our country was maybe the first real example in all of history of creating new wealth. Prior to the United States of America, European nations like Spain and England and France, they fought over the same pile of wealth all the time. They were constantly at war with one another and taking the same wealth back and forth. America was different because we made our own wealth based on the resources that we had and the ingenuity of the people that came here. And that wealth creation means that there's new wealth constantly be cre being created. So the idea that you have to take from one person to give to another is wrong. What we should be doing is constantly be working towards having a thriving economy that makes more and more wealth and therefore more opportunity for more people to have their share of it. That's why I'm here, Madam President, and that's why I don't like this bill. Because this bill is just another thing telling an employer, if you are not careful, we are going to put the government right on you to stop you, to prevent you from going ahead and entering into an arrangement that might produce wealth for you and your employees. Something we have no need for and no reason to do. Aside from which, this bill suffers from the typical problem of bills that come before this chamber lately, which is that it doesn't really say much. It's completely vague. And it requires that some third party uh, member of the bureaucracy to determine what's really going on. 
I have one question, Madam President. One question for the proponent of the bill. This bill says that an employer shall disclose a uh, pay range to an applicant for empo employment. And then it goes on to say what a wage range means. Wage range means the range of wages an employer anticipates relying on when setting wages for a position and may include reference to any applicable pay scale, previously determined range of wages for the position, actual range of wages for those employees currently holding comparable positions, or the employer's budgeted amount for the position. My question, Madam President, is there anything wrong with an employer using a very broad number? Like for whatever the minimum wage might be, up to a million dollars because they honestly don't know how much they would pay a prospective employee because they have never met such a prospective employee and they're not sure what their qualifications might be or how much value they might add to their business. Would they be wrong from saying minimum wage all the way up to $5,000 an hour? Through you, Madam President. Senator Kushner. Thank you, Madam President. This bill, I believe, spells out very clearly the Requ the requisite guidelines for what a wage range would be. It does not say that it has to be any particular range. It is very clear that it says it can be any applicable pay range, that it can be previously determined range. You've read the language, my good friend and senator, uh, ranking member from the Labor Committee, so I think you understand it does not include a specific number that is attached to it in any way. Thank you, Madam President. Yes, I do understand completely Senator what the language Sampson. says. I'm sorry. I didn't no, mean to cut you no off, worries. Madam President. Yes, and thank you very much for that answer. And it's quite clear. There's nothing wrong with that. And that's a good thing. Because as an employer, you don't necessarily know what you're going to pay someone. You might, in fact, have an idea about some of these things. You might have had a previous employee doing a similar job. But let me explain one thing that people who are not running businesses might not understand. Every time you change an employee, they're doing a different job than the last person. They just are. Even if it's the same exact job description, even if you hired them for the same thing, they are not doing the same job. And you know why, Madam President? It's because people are different. They are not cogs. There is not, we are just gonna replace this person and put this person in and they are exactly identical, no. Some people are more proficient at different things. Some people show up on time, some people don't. Some people can make 100 widgets an hour, some people can only make 50. All of these things are subjective in every way, shape, and form. And if I hire someone to work for my company and I think I'm only gonna pay them minimum wage because they're gonna do the minimal uh, expectation of the job, and then on the second day they impress me that they are so much more capable and I wanna actually bring them into a different role, and actually expand their responsibilities, then that range is obviously going to be different, which is why it is impossible and in fact foolish and improper to require an employer to disclose a pay range in advance for something they cannot properly determine. It's also very one-sided because this bill nowhere says the employee has to disclose anything to the employer. And as I pointed out before, it is not the duty of this body to be the collective bargaining agent for employees. It is our job to protect employees, to make sure they are treated fairly, and that we have sound policy that doesn't allow them to be exploited. But it is not our business or our duty to go ahead and take sides in a free negotiation between that employer and employee to work out the terms of what their agreement is. I can speak ad nauseum about why our system works, why it has been beneficial, why we are uh, fortunate to live in the greatest society in the greatest period of time in all human history is all based on the freedom that we are interfering with every day we come into this circle and pass bills like this. And yeah, this is a minor example, but it is still another example of something that doesn't benefit anyone. It's not going to improve situations. We already proved that an employer can put down any range they want, and they should be able to. And they should be able to talk to their employee, and their employee should be able to talk to them because no one's forcing either party. 
No one's saying you have to hire this person. No one's saying you have to take this job. No one's saying you have to stay at this job. Dangerously, though, we are passing more policies that are telling the employer what they can and cannot do about who they keep and who they bring back to the job and what they have to tell people. The best solution is always freedom. Groucho Marx, who I would never think of as being a political genius, is quoted as saying, politics is the art of looking for trouble, finding it everywhere, diagnosing it incorrectly, and applying the wrong remedies. This is the wrong remedy, Madam President, and I will not be supporting the bill. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Sampson. We'll